USAV FP344 started life as part of a relatively mundane class of light cargo ships built for the US Army. So mundane, in fact, that, as you can tell, she had a number designation rather than a name. With a displacement well under a 1,000 tonnes and a mere 10-foot draft, she was well suited to moving small amounts of cargo around shallow coastal environments, but was just about large enough to also be able to make her way unassisted across the oceans for redeployment. Her FP designation signified that she was designed to transport freight and passengers, but she was soon redesignated to FS-344, the S standing for supply instead of passengers. Laid down and launched in 1944, she was commissioned in April 1945, but didn't actually see service in any active World War II war zone, instead initially being used for training, although later on she would also be deployed to the Philippines. But by 1954, the sheer number of World War II built vessels, and the downsizing of budgets, saw FS-344 taken out of service and placed in reserve. A decade later, though, the US was looking at expanding its array of spy ships, the recently commissioned existing fleet was based largely on modified Liberty and Victory type freighters, but these were quite large, quite obvious, and relatively expensive to run. It was thought that replacing the half dozen or so such vessels with a couple of dozen much smaller and less expensive craft would allow for a cheaper and more flexible service, since more ships could cover more areas at once, whilst also having most of them in reserve or at low readiness most of the time. In aid of this, FS-344 was taken out of mothballs and transferred to the US Navy in April 1966 as USS Pueblo AKL-44, the latter designation signifying an ostensible role as a light cargo ship. However, once she arrived in Puget Sound for a refit, she would emerge as the Banner-class Environmental Research Ship, USS Pueblo AGER-2, in the end, they'd actually only do three of these conversions, but that's somewhat beside the point. Re-emerging the following year with a wide array of electronic equipment aboard, along with some actual environmental analysis equipment and a pair of civilian oceanographers to help maintain her ostensible cover, she set sail for Yakuzka in Japan after a brief shakedown cruise. In January 1968, she headed out on her first mission which was to include keeping an eye on the activities of the Soviet Pacific Fleet, which was tempting fate by operating in the Tsushima Strait. She was now minimally armed, as opposed to completely unarmed. She had a pair of 50 cal machine guns, but no one on board seemed to actually pay any real attention to them. This spying activity was fairly standard for the Cold War, although technically operating under civilian auspices, both sides of the Cold War were perfectly aware of what the other spy ships were when they sailed close to naval exercises and so forth, and since both sides did this, providing the spy craft didn't enter territorial waters or do anything else stupidly dangerous, they were generally left alone in an unspoken reciprocal agreement. Someone, however, seems to have forgotten that the international third wheel that is North Korea wasn't really part of this. In any case, another part of Pueblo's mission was to gather intel off the North Korean coast, and since these were the days before GPS and other precision navigation devices, the ship was ordered to stay at least 13 nautical miles away from the coast during the day, but to move considerably further out at night, when darkness and cloud might mean that the ship drifted somewhat off the course they thought they were on. This was because international law at the time said that nations were entitled to a 12 nautical mile limit to their territorial waters. It should be noted, though, that North Korea, along with a number of other countries, claimed a territorial waters boundary that extended considerably further out. On the 20th of January 1968 came the first indication of North Korean attention. A smaller, but significantly more heavily armed craft, a patrol boat, showed up, passing by a few kilometres away, clearly making an assessment of the new interloper. Two days later, on the 22nd, a pair of fishing trawlers showed up, and passed by considerably closer. And then, on the 23rd, it all started to go very wrong. Another patrol boat showed up and challenged the Pueblo to prove its identity. It responded by hoisting a US flag to demonstrate it was American, at which point Pueblo was ordered to stand down or be fired upon. At some stage during these proceedings, a trio of North Korean torpedo boats also showed up. Pueblo then made for the open seas at her top speed a very stately 12 knots, with the considerably faster North Korean craft following in something of a parody pursuit whilst yelling at her to come back and stop moving. 
More North Korean attack craft and a few fighters began to show up, but despite Pueblo's repeated calls, there were no US aircraft in the area to come to her assistance, either on land or aboard the carriers, at least none capable of launching anytime soon. After a number of boarding attempts were seen off by some sharp manoeuvring, the North Korean ships got fed up and opened fire, causing some injuries. Realising at this point that they were definitely not going to escape, the crew made a start at destroying sensitive material, but attempts to delay their capture further to buy more time for this destruction led to the only death of the incident when a further burst of fire designed to chivy them along killed one of the crew. North Korea naturally made the claim that the ship had been in their territorial waters, whilst the US equally naturally claimed that it hadn't. Finally boarded and taken back to North Korea, the surviving sensitive material was largely shipped off to the USSR, and the crew were sent to prisoner of war camps, where they would be badly mistreated for almost a year before being released. The ship itself was retained by North Korea and has now been turned into a tourist attraction, although the US Navy has kept the ship on the books as a commissioned vessel, which at the time of writing in 2023 has had the unintended side effect of making Pueblo the oldest commissioned ship in the US Navy, apart from USS Constitution. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.